So for our last one of the simulation, we're gonna take Ford's mass production system and morph it into lean production. So we're gonna focus on quality at the source, level loading, pulling, and pacing. This is what I mean by quality at the source. You can't inspect quality and it has to be built into the process. So this little jig here makes sure that every first fold is correct because we noticed that the majority of the defects were happening early in the process. So just with these three nails, if you lay the piece of paper on here, you know every single time you're getting a perfect fold. So this is what I mean by level loading. You can tell from the second run that this production line was not very well level loaded. Worker one only had to do one fold, whereas worker four had to do four folds. Workers two and three only had to do two folds a piece. As a result of the imbalance, you can see that worker one had the least to do. Worker four had the most to do with four folds. Worker one could outpace everyone, and the majority of the whip was caused by worker one. Now as a customer, I need planes every 24 seconds, and the way the system's set up right now, they can't make it, because worker four takes about 32 seconds to complete his portion. So this is where level loading comes in. You can see that we divided all the folds pretty evenly across all the operators. You can also tell that they'll easily be able to meet the customer demand of making a plane every 24 seconds. For run three, the team decided not to use a material handler and a manager because they were adding no value to the final product. The production line was reconfigured so everyone was sitting very close to one another. This eliminated the need for the material handler. There were also post-it notes placed between each workstation. This was to prevent overproduction. Remember during the last run when there was a staggering 57 pieces of work in process? These post-it notes prevent that. The simple production rule that the team agreed to was to only produce when the post-it note to their immediate right was not covered by a plane that was in work in process. Only when the post-it note was exposed by the next operator taking that piece of work in process could the previous worker begin working. This is called pull production. This is in contrast to push production you saw during the last run. This simple control eliminates the need for a manager as the pace and amount of production is totally dictated by how often the customer pulls a plane. Notice that with this control in place, the worst case scenario can be three pieces of work in process at any given time. These concepts that Smith, Ford, and Toyota developed don't have to be limited to assembly. If you're like most companies or hospitals, paperwork is another factor that no one pays attention to. It takes a long time for people working in this area to learn how to process orders or invoices. Why not set these individuals up in a cell similar to this one? Each worker would process just a component of the order or invoice and pass it along. I've personally created numerous cells in office environments for order processing where people didn't believe a work cell concept applied. The results were huge gains in productivity and far fewer defects. Notice the slower and more controlled pace the operators are working at. They agreed not to push defects onto the next workstation and to stop and fix defects as they find them. Luckily, the jig we built into station one has eliminated the majority of the defects. Even though they are not being managed and working at a slower pace, I noticed planes being completed predictably every 24 seconds. Notice the previous two runs, there was no way to tell how often planes would exit the system. The X plane actually made it through the system in just under one minute. So let's review our metrics for the third run. You can see as far as space goes, they only used two tables because they were much more compact. Work and process only three and that was controlled by the Kanban in between each station. They actually produced 16 good planes which is nearly double what they produced by using mass production. 100% of the planes were good because of the quality at the source. Lead time was one minute. It was predictably one minute the X plane flowed through. Number of people in the system, four. They ran again for five minutes, and their productivity, which is good parts, divided by people, divided by time, is 0.8. So you can see that even though they were working at a slower pace, by pulling and pacing, they were actually able to more than triple their productivity. They also were able to more than double the amount of good planes that they built, and their quality was impeccable, 100%. This last run is optional. If you have some colored paper and some colored post-it notes, you can run this portion of the simulation. But this portion of the simulation is just to show you that it can run with multiple types rather than just one single model. For this final run, we set up colored post-it notes to correspond to each of the four different plane models we're making. Red, yellow, green, and blue. An exposed red post-it lets the operator know that the final customer along the line pulled a red plane. Only the pulled color is replaced. I also wanted to show you a U-shaped cell. This is traditionally how cells are set up. We'll develop this further in the cell series. 
but workers are generally kept on the inside of cells to minimize walking between stations and to lend a helping hand when needed. Also notice that the cell can either expand or shrink depending on customer demand. If demand goes down for colored planes, the cell can run just as well with two operators as it would with four, just at a slower pace. So here's a summary of what we learned. We learned that lean has a very long history. I started the lesson at Adam Smith, but some say it even predates him. Now the reason why I started with Adam Smith and went forward is because I want to show that lean has a long history. It's not just a flavor of the month or something that showed up in the last five years. Next we learned that lean was developed through an iterative learning process throughout history. So we started with Adam Smith, we had Frederick Taylor contributing, Henry Ford, Kichiro Toyota, each man taking the previous contributor's work and developing a little more into what we know as lean manufacturing today. We finally learned that about 60 years ago, Toyota began to formalize all this learning and put it into a comprehensive system that we know as lean today. Finally, I want to mention that lean has many components. It is one business philosophy. Now, this is broken down into easy to understand steps on this website, but it functions as one comprehensive philosophy.